everyone. Um, I am so happy that Lupus LA provided me with the opportunity to talk to all of you today. Um, and I know today's topic is health equity and COVID. So I hope that you'll be learning many things um, by the time that we conclude today's presentation. So before we begin and do a deeper dive on the topic and you know touch on why this topic impacts individuals with lupus, I'm gonna provide you a bit of my background. So um, just to give you a little bit of information about who I am, so my name is Dr. Karen Mancera Cuevas. Um, I am currently the Deputy Director at the Illinois Department of Public Health, and I am the Deputy Director of the Office of Health Promotion. So we do um, a lot of um, health-related uh, topics, uh, diabetes, cancer, asthma, oral health, uh, dementia, uh, everything related to violence prevention statewide for the state of Illinois. So I've worked for the state of Illinois and um, have a extensive experience in public health. So prior to this role, um, what gives me um, a bit more expertise in the era, area of lupus is that I worked for a decade in the lupus space um, in um, primarily clinical research, um, public health research, um, community-based participatory research um, in a unit led by Dr. Rosalind, Rosalind Ramsey Goldman, and she is out of Northwestern University, so one of the foremost experts in lupus and trained under that individual, and um, spent a lot of time doing a lot of work in that space, um, and then prior to that, um, worked in um, Northwestern University uh, working in studies in cardiovascular epidemiology in large um, in longitudinal cohorts. Um, and then prior to that experience, I worked at the University of Illinois Chicago um, doing work in the research of reproductive genetics, which ties to my current role because many of the reproductive genetics work that I did early in my career are the statewide programs that I oversee on newborn genetics um, and a lot of also work in BRCA1, BRCA2, um, which are breast cancer genetic um, genes and what many women who are at risk of get tested for. And my first job out of college was working at the Epilepsy Foundation. So with them, I did work with um, engaging communities on Epilepsy 101, and I did a lot of case management work with the Latino community. So a lot there. Um, and my training, as I said, you know, has been extensive. I have a doctorate of public health. Um, I have a master's of public health um, as well, a master's of science in healthcare administration and a bachelor's degree in community health education. So um, I primarily identify myself as a community health educator professionally, although I do have a strong clinical research background because I've done it for many years, um, particularly many years of those doing lupus cl clinical trials, um, but that is my primary interest. So I just wanted to lay the groundwork of who I was before we begin. So again, Today's conversation is health equity and COVID. Many of you first on the topic of COVID, what are the basics in terms of transmission, acquisition, the face uh, masking, the distancing, the changing of the rules, the changing of the guidelines. But today, you know, like my primary purpose of conversing really was to just touch on why COVID is a health equity topic. Um, and really to provide a lot of background, you know, like as we know, historically, um, you know, minority communities have been significantly put at risk during COVID. And it's because many individuals from diverse racial ethnic communities are more likely to have pre-existing conditions. It may be that they have heart disease, um, they have um, a lot of cerebrovascular issues, they may have pulmonary issues. Specifically, if you're looking within individuals who have lupus, they also oftentimes have organ related issues um, related to damage um, that you know, lupus sequelae has led to. And so, 
you know, when you're looking specifically at the lupus population, even within COVID equity, it's a subpopulation within a large population that oftentimes has their own needs in terms of access to care, treatment, and the such. But at least the crux of the conversation will be the general population, and then I can, you know, really pivot um, my talk a little bit more towards individuals with lupus and, you know, what are their specific needs. So, um, so I just really wanted to, you know, lay the groundwork as well in terms of why we should be thinking that this is an important topic, um, as there's many uh, communities that are impacted. And so, and so I know this is um, a national Facebook presentation, um, and I work in one state, one state may not be the same as other states, and there might be um, certain populations that are at risk in other states, and it's just because of the makeup of the population of that state. It may be that you have individuals in that state that are rural that are more at risk than people that live in urban populations. And I do also want to provide the audience um, information that I do recognize that there's difference and that also can impact equity in your community or area that's different than the community and area that I necessarily oversee um, in the Midwest of the country. So um, that's really real, why we want to say racial ethnic disparities are important because of those types of reasons. Um, and that these, of course, are just broad based, you know, like um, information. I didn't necessarily today want to go into slides and the such just because I wanted to make today's presentation much more informational and interactive for the audience. So hopefully um, there will be a lot that you will gain from today's talk. So when we talk about like racial and like COVID equity topics, there's just, you know, like a lot out there in terms of, you know, things that potentially could impact people. A lot of it um, that has been mentioned has been particularly, you know, like mental health and uh, social isolation, which um, likely many of those of you with lupus have already, you know, already experienced prior to the pandemic and likely have become a bit more exacerbated in terms of um, exposure and really having a lot more challenges. And keep in mind that um, with the changing climate of COVID, it also, with restrictions being lifted, there also have been changes, you know, like in terms of uh, mitigations and what we knew about COVID before is different than today. But um, that also has changed the trajectory um, in terms of how then individuals cope with the condition, um, are able to get social support, are able to get um, individuals on their side who can, you know, potentially provide much more resources um, if someone were to become much more challenged socially or mentally. So I really wanted to bring that up as well because it has been a public health issue which has been much more vocally addressed than before, but is really important for the general population, but also specifically for individuals with lupus who may be um, challenged in, in that area as well and may need more support in order to um, cope with the current um, ongoing changing uh, face of COVID of, you know, sometimes we have a lot of increased variants and other times um, COVID numbers come down significantly. So that can be hard for many individuals. Um, now moving on to general issues with relation to um, COVID, it's really important to think about when we think about racial ethnic disparities, doing a deeper dive in terms of the groups that are impacted. Um, and I really, in my conversation today, just really jotted down brief notes as to who are those groups that are the most impacted in this front. And so first group that I wanted to cover is agricultural workers. Agricultural workers are significantly and have been significantly impacted with COVID and health equity topics, largely because they're oftentimes in communities where they're individuals who are undocumented and may not be able to access appropriate services in their localities. 
um, also because of migratory status um, and general access to care. So, you know, when we think about who is at risk and we look at populations, um, agricultural workers are one of those populations that, you know, particularly for people who work in public health, people who work in medicine, really need to be like cognizant about. Um, the other, you know, population that we're going to cover today are individuals with disabilities. Individuals with disabilities, obviously, is a broad-based category. Um, physical disabilities, uh, intellectual disabilities are covered within that, those categories. Um, people with disabilities encounter many challenges, particularly early in the pandemic. There were a lot of concerns of uh, individuals with disabilities being able to access systems, to be able to be prioritized for care, to be able to access vaccines. Um, if many individuals with physical disabilities often are dependent on caregivers or caretakers, um, and if their access is restricted because of um, disease mitigation, it is hard for them, the individual for, with disabilities, to be able to properly engage. Um, I know early in the pandemic, I worked with the Lupus Society of Illinois using a specific lupus example in order to find a um, appropriate um, venue for an individual with lupus that was very high risk and who needed access to the vaccine when the vaccine just came out for care um, and that lived in a very rural part of the state of Illinois. And so for that individual, there was a lot of work inclusive of the regional health officer for that region to be able to navigate that individual to care. And it was more due to the physical disability, secondarily due, due to the lupus that the individual was diagnosed with in terms of being able to access services. So really important when we think about COVID, you know, like and the health equity topic that, you know, many individuals with disabilities were, were, were considered not only high risk because of the um, classification that they had, but also because of accessibility. And accessibility really became critical for that type of population. Um, in addition to that, a very high risk population is senior citizens. So senior citizens, um, I wanted to cover as part of my presentation today because huge swath of the population in the United States. We have many baby boomers in the United States um, that um, encounter many chronic diseases. Uh, obviously a sub entity of those people have lupus, a very small or significant sample within that larger group. It is really important to understand that um, senior citizens um, it, are were considered a priority to group for vaccination because again, of health equity related topics, health equity meaning lack of access to care, uh, sometimes limited support systems, sometimes challenges with social determinants of health may belong and live in communities that are very poor, um, very disenfranchised, or may not be engaged with any social support system or medical support system. So really want to convey that message that they were another group that were high risk. Um, also on the list here, we have refugees and migrants. So as you know, we have, you know, many Afghan refugees that have resettled into various parts of the United States. Um, in Illinois, like we've been doing a lot of work in terms of welcoming um, these new refugees to the U.S. Um, but in uh, other parts of the country, there are certain sometimes challenges that refugees and migrants face because they are not acclimated to the United States and so may not be as resourceful in terms of using the system um, as individuals who are residents of those states, counties, and areas um, for a long amount of time. So what that involves and uh, why does that become then a COVID equity topic is because those individuals then have a harder time figuring out, okay, where do I access care? Where should I be going for treatment, et cetera? So that's really important in terms of really guiding those individuals, finding social service organizations, finding community-based organizations so that the individual then can properly navigate the system.
um, and get resources and oftentimes in their native language, which um, in some localities, translators and interpreters are available and in others that's much more limited. So another um, barrier to access to care and equity is language. So uh, it's important to consider that as a uh, barrier that you know we need to really find solutions for in order for the individual to then be able to get vaccinated, tested, et cetera, with relation to COVID um, and exercise proper hygiene practices, which is always a good preventive measure for any type of condition. Um, so another high-risk group in, um, has been largely um, under um, spoken to has been individuals who live in detention facilities or correctional facilities. We have many of our um, individuals in many states who live in correctional and det detentional facilities who um, were at high risk of COVID just largely due to proximity um, to other individuals. And really there were campaigns that specifically were directed to individuals that were in those types of facilities but also um, potentially our high risk group because of issues related to equity. We wanna make sure that proper treatment and care is given to these individuals, if they're exposed to COVID, uh, timely care in terms of proper treatment. Um, so uh, another highly impacted community. Um, the other communities that I also wanted to highlight on were um, tribal community members. So tribes meaning Native American tribes, indigenous tribes. We have many of our native indigenous tribes throughout the United States. Many of our native indigenous tribes re are reliant on services through the Indian Health Service, um, through federal qualified health centers. Um, but you know, because of many historical oppression related issues, um, lack of access, um, lack of education, lack of support system within the communities, um, the Native peoples um, have been considered a high priority area in terms of COVID response, that really it's important, you know, like for um, future, you know, like planning um, relation in relation to COVID today, um, that's imperative for us to continue, um, largely because um, also, there has to be management of pre-existing conditions, um, and many COVID, and many of the COVID indigenous populations or indigenous individuals were exposed to COVID. Um, in, in addition to the social support and the mental health, well-being, um, and support that should be provided to those communities. Um, the other populations at risk: um, homeless population. Homeless population has a lot of um, risk factors and a lot of it's related to um, unstable housing, violence oftentimes with individuals in this population. Um, so there are oftentimes community members who may not have as much um, constant social support from the same entities. And so, you know, like campaigns directed to the homeless really um, should continue through the process because homeless population you know, um, plays a significant role in many major cities and also urban areas throughout the United States. So um, also another consideration to be made. Um, rural population, rural population throughout the United States, there are different rural populations that we have and each rural population um, is really dependent on their locality. So in some rural communities, a strong um, COVID uptake and response in other rural communities, that was not the case. And just a lot of this is not generalities. It's really going to be local and very specific based on geography. So really, it's important for um, the Lupus LA members to really understand that, that a lot of those are locality specific. Um, and obviously, community-based testing sites, um, access to um, facilities for treatment and care are really gonna be important. Um, rural population encompasses also many individuals with lupus. Um, historically in the years that I worked more in the lupus specific space, we had many of our um, participants in research studies and um, also rheumatology patients come from rural parts of the United States where there wasn't a specialized rheumatologist to treat lupus and came from far away, 
Um, and when you encounter individuals like that, which is what I gave earlier in the um, lupus um, uh, Illinois example, can happen. So um, a lot more work in terms of engagement. Primarily, as we know, as lupus is an autoimmune disease, but when you combine an autoimmune disease with COVID, it's not necessarily an ideal situation. So definitely we wanna have our rural population, particularly when talking about lupus, our rural lupus population um, as protected as possible in terms of having them have the most optimal access and care um, possible so that they can avoid that emergency room visit, which can occur obviously with a lupus flare. So wanted to highlight that um, in today's talk. Um, and lastly, what is our like our high risk group are individuals who abuse drugs, um, high risk because they may not be as healthy, may not be taking the care of themselves as much. Um, so if they expose themselves to COVID unintentionally, um, it can cause consequences, health consequences for that individual um, that may further complicate, you know, their well-being, um, whether physical well-being and also mental health well-being. So um, the last of the high-risk populations and all of the high-risk populations that I've mentioned today, um, I will be providing the Lupus LA with a CDC.gov um, link that really covers in depth um, health equity topics and COVID that really is, um, as I say to many individuals, very reliable source, but again, um, really providing the most accurate information as to why these groups are at um, highest risk um, of COVID and really what is the federal response and really based on the federal response where the directives really at the local level whether it be through public health clinics, medical centers, government entities, but a lot of um, entities that are really looking for these really most high risk populations. So I'm just, you know, briefly going to cover, um, you know, access care and treatment and support for individuals with lupus. And so as we know, this is a very highly specialized um, for, just um, the subgroup within a larger population. And, you know, so COVID guidelines are, are different in terms of vaccination and treatment and um, care. And I just really wanted to touch on it briefly, largely because a lot of that needs to be under care and treatment of a rheumatologist specialist. Um, and the, I know that there's been a lot of conversation on biologics um, biologics and that conversation as um, monoclonal antibodies really needs to be a conversation held with rheumatologists. And so from the public health perspective and really blending that into the COVID conversation, it really is individual. Um, so really consider that if those are, you know, topics that pertain to you and concerns of concerns, how does the COVID vaccine interact with my lupus medication, how, you know, will COVID impact my life um, medically, how, you know, like our, you know, like systems of care, those are very individualistic in terms of support. And many of the lupus entities have been very um, helpful in terms of providing COVID information to individuals with lupus. So I think that, that is, you know, a very positive sign from the localities to provide that support. As we know, um, it can be a barrage of information um, as to what to do with um, the information of what is accurate and inaccurate when you're dealing with a chronic condition. Um, but feel rest assured that, you know, the support based entities, including Lupus LA, have been a really great source of support along this journey of COVID um, and, you know, dealing with equity related topics. It's really going to be informative. So I'm going to conclude my presentation today with the q and I know that like there's been several questions about like um, equity. And so I really wanted to cover that um, in today's talk before we conclude. So, so like the first question is like, what is um, health inequity? And health inequity is really when some people have access to health and resources information, treatment, um, oftentimes social support 
and others do not. So with the inequity, you cause that difference in between those who do and those who don't. And so what you're trying to do when you're trying to do equity related programs is you're trying to level the playing field. So as I said, I went through the CDC high risk groups and with the CDC high risk groups, what you want to do is level the playing field. So you want to give more access to care for individuals with home that are homeless. Um, particularly if they have COVID, um, if they need proper treatment to really be proactive on that. So that is um, the response to that question. And then I'm going to move on to question two. Are lupus patients affected by health inequity? And yes, they are for a variety of reasons. And I know that there's many researchers, actually the lupus space who talk about this. One of the individuals that I worked for, Dr. Ramsey Goldman, um, I know is an expert in this topic. Candace Feldman is an expert on this topic. Um, and the reason is, is really because of the fact that you have those structural related issues. So if you're a lupus patient that lives in a poor community, then you are impacted by maybe not readily being able to see a rheumatologist because you don't have the transportation to get there or because you don't have the best diet and nutrition, it may be impacting your lupus um, because you may need to be, get a, a different type of diet, but you may not be able to afford it. Um, also, if you have challenges in terms of understanding and navigating the system, then those inequities exacerbate because it's harder than to figure out what specialist you need to see, right? And if you're an individual with lupus, you're seeing like tons of doctors, you might see a pulmonologist, a nephrologist besides your primary and your rheumatologist. So it's really hard to do everything um, and to keep up with all those things. And especially if like you might be an individual who is disadvantage because you belong to any of those categories that I previously mentioned. Um, you are an individual who is agricultural worker. It's super hard, right? If like you have to then figure out to find a rheumatologist, let's say if you're undocumented, um, it, you, you would have to go to a public hospital likely and even to get within the system could take a long time and you might complicate it along the way and end up in an emergency room. So. That's why inequities exacerbate um, and really make it much more difficult in terms of care and also in terms of outcomes. So if you can be preventive, um, it's more ideal, particularly your lupus care, than um, if it's harder to access systems and then you end up you know, in hospital systems when you're really, really sick or when you flare. Okay, so moving on to the third question, what populations are affected by health inequity and what does this look like? So just kind of just went through that in my presentation. Um, the populations are varied. It depends, you know, like where you are. Um, it could be rural populations as much as actually it can be urban populations and they're really for very different reasons for public health purposes. So, um, Health inequities, it's really important because we want to advocate for those who don't have access to services and don't have access to care so that we can level the playing field. And in a lot of ways, it reduces health care costs, reduces oftentimes costs on Medicare and Medicaid when we can reduce those costs. So it reduces the cost, you know, overall in terms of the federal system and the taxpayer, but also increases the livelihood of individuals in the society. So those people live longer, healthier lives. Um, if we can get them preventive treatment, care, intervention, proper support timely. So that's, that's the bottom line of the importance of that. So the next question is, what can be done to close the inequity gaps in healthcare? That could be a presentation that's like an hour long. So there's like um, a lot of things that can be done. Many of them are structural related um, issues. So it would be um, really providing more access to federally qualified health centers. It would be providing access to care for migrants and refugees in areas that are not readily accessible. It would be to provide more access within the hospital-based systems that oftentimes are very large and are already overburdened, um, but really to provide access to specialty populations that I've just 
gone through that are really at high risk for COVID um, and other healthcare conditions. I don't want to ignore that there's tons of other conditions that are out there that I know it, although COVID is an infectious disease, chronic disease is also one of the leading killers in the United States. So um, really important to keep that in mind as well. So uh, to answer the last question, has COVID highlighted or changed awareness around health inequity? I think it has. And it has significantly because now we're having many of these conversations about who are the haves and who are the have nots. Um, really, there's been a lot of push um, in many states and I lead an equity grant in, for COVID for the state. And we're really reaching out to rural communities, to homeless, to LGBTQ plus communities, to uh, diverse minority communities, to disenfranchised communities, refugees, um, homeless and the such to really get them engaged in terms of treatment, in terms of care, in terms of prevention, hand washing, um, and really engaging in communication campaigns, which is relevant to their community, right? So social media might be helpful to certain populations, but not others, particularly rural populations, maybe much more engaged with print ads, radio ads, in-person conversations, um, flyers in supermarkets, et cetera. So a variety of different approaches. So I really wanna conclude the presentation right now. Um, I've highlighted a lot of the um, high-risk groups for COVID equity and why it's important, um, touched on, you know, just general lupus and, you know, COVID, just because I would like a lot of people to specifically have um, more information in a conversation with a rheumatologist that's very clinical specific and um, tailored to your individual needs and have answered general Q&A. Um, I will provide a resource to Lupus LA and I hope everyone enjoys the rest of the day. And that is the conclusion of today's presentation. Thank you so much.